on behalf of the Australian National University, I'm delighted to welcome you all here to the 2012 Narayanan Oration, the 16th in this series. We're particularly pleased to welcome His Excellency, Mr. Biran Nanda, the High Commissioner for India, and Mrs. Nanda. This annual lecture is organised by the Australia South Asia Research Centre, the ASARC, in the ANU College of Asia and the Pacific, and is part of the ANU Public Lecture Series. The lecture honours His Excellency Dr. K. R. Narayanan, past President of India. Dr. Narayanan inaugurated the ASARC in 1994 and maintained an active interest in its work until his passing in 2005. Our speaker today is Dr. Kashik Basu, Chief Economic Advisor to the Ministry of Finance and the Government of India. He is also on leave from Cornell University where he is Professor of Economics and the C. Marks Professor of International Studies. His past appointments include Chairman of the Development sorry, Chairman of the Department of Economics and Director of the Centre for Analytical Economics at Cornell and Professor of Economics at the Delhi School of Economics, where in 1992 he founded the Centre for Development Economics and was its first Executive Director. He is also a founding member of the Madras School of Economics. Dr. Basu is currently the President of the Human Development and Capabilities Association. He has held advisory posts with the International Labour Organisation, the World Bank, the Reserve Bank of India and was, for several years, a member of the steering committee of the expert group on development issues set up by the Swedish government. He is currently a member of the board of directors of the Exim Bank of India, a fellow of the Economic Society. Dr. Basu, Basu has published widely in the areas of development economics, industrial organisation, game theory and welfare economics. In May 2008, he was awarded one of India's highest civilian awards, the Padma Pashan, by the President of India. We would like to thank the Australia India Council for supporting this lecture and welcome all members of the Council who are attending this oration today. May I now request His Excellency, Mr. Biran Nanda, High Commissioner for India, to read out a message from the President of India, Her Excellency, Mrs. Pratibha Patil. I am happy to learn that the Australia South Asia Research Centre at the Australian National University is organising the 16th PR Narayana Coalition on the theme The Indian Economy Rising to Global Challenges by Dr. Kaushik Pasu, Chief Economic Advisor, Ministry of Finance, Government of India. The Indian economy has emerged as the third largest economy in Asia, a, tri a trillion dollar economy that has joined the ranks of the top 10 economies of the world. A noticeable feature of India's economic growth is that it is largely driven by domestic demand. While India's growth trajectory has been good in the recent past, it has also been resilient. India has to maintain a high growth path for another 30 years to attain the status of a developed country to fully satisfy the aspirations of a people. For this, several challenges need to be addressed. The challenges of poverty, eradication, unemployment, bridging the rural, urban and regional divides, and achieving inclusive growth that leads to sustainable development. India also needs to address critical challenges relating to energy, food, water, security and climate change. I have no doubt that the oration will give insights into these issues for the audience. I wish the oration all success. Pratibha Devi Singh Party, President of the Republic of India, New Delhi, May 28th, 2012. Thank you, Your Excellency. It's now my very great pleasure to invite Dr. Basu to deliver the 2012 K.R. Nai Rayanan Oration. His Excellency Sri Biren Nanda, Mrs. Nanda, uh, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Ian, Ian Yang, uh, my colleague from Delhi School of Economics years ago, Raghavendra Jha. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I know several people have been behind organizing this. I'll begin by saying that I'm just extremely grateful for uh, the honor. Um, I feel humbled by it uh, and giving me the opportunity to address uh, people here. Uh, I don't know who all were um, involved in the organization, but I must mention Aarti, who's really helped me last two days, Alan, uh, 
Uh, I've managed to do a 20 minute uh, round of the National Gallery of Art. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so my days, two days were cut up into half an hour slots, but I really packed in so much because of the kindness of uh, people who were organizing this. Thank you once again. Let me begin by saying that I feel humbled uh, by this invitation, both because of the person after whom the lecture series is named, India's ex-president, uh, Sri Narayanan, um, a, a, a remarkable human being, uh, starting out with great, great disadvantages in life, a Dalit, with all the discrimination that was there historically, and remnants of that even there today, that he faced as a child growing up, there are accounts of his hardship. There were times when the family was too poor to pay his school fees. And the rule in his school was that you could not be inside the class if you had not paid your fees. So he would have to stand outside and listen to what was going on. Grew up to be a phenomenal academic performer and then into the foreign service and quite a remarkable career. Uh, um, in Asian countries, uh, Leaders do talk about how many miles they had to walk to go to school every day. And on that, actually, Narayanan takes the cake, I think, because I've read Park Chung-hee doing some three, four miles a day to get to his school. There are other kinds of mileages I've heard. Uh, I recently learned that uh, Narayanan had to do 15 kilometers a day to get to his school. So he takes the cake on how far you have to walk to get to school. India's first prime minister, unfortunately, didn't have to walk at all because he was so well off. And I think he used to try to hide the fact that he would be dropped off at his school most of the time, Pandit Nehru. But it's a different range of experiences and different range of achievements. Friends, I'm also honored by the distinguished list. I knew of a couple of people who have uh, spoken in this series. Uh, my friends in government, uh, Dr. Motek Singh Aluwalia, Dr. Subha Rao. Uh, in fact, I was in Sydney around the time when Subarao was giving the lecture here and uh, discovered that he was here for the Narayanan lecture. So it's great to be following in their footsteps. footsteps. The big story for India, and I thought that's why I'll pick uh, this lecture on that, is the globalization of the economy. India getting hooked up to the world. Uh, yes, the growth has been phenomenal. There have been other achievements. And all big surprises, really, because I remember as professor in the Delhi School of Economics in the 1980s, uh, it would be taken for granted that, yes, the country had made some remarkable achievements in terms of political openness, cultural openness. Our doors were open to books, films, ideas coming in from all over industrialized countries. But economically, we were relatively closed. And we were more or less reconciled to the fact that it would be a close, chugging economy that would continue endlessly. That changed. That changed very, very dramatically over a relatively short period. We are going through a very difficult time right now, and I will talk about it. This past year has been very difficult for the economy. But if you look at a 15-year run, it has been an outstanding run. But the most outstanding feature of that is the hooking up to the world and the responsibilities and challenges that come with that hooking up. I thought I'm going to peg it around that and bring you up to today's contemporary debates. I'm going to make use of my somewhat dual perch. I've been a professor all my life, an academic. Then uh, two and a half years ago, completely out of the blue, when I was taking a summer vacation in Delhi, I get a call from the Prime Minister's office asking me whether I would be interested in the job of the Chief Economic Advisor. Uh, I, I was thrown off by that. There was absolutely no hint that this was coming. Uh, the following day, I was returning to the US. I said that the, it's a very nice offer, but I really need to speak to the Prime Minister since you're calling from the Prime Minister's office. It's too big a thing suddenly being suggested to me. And I got to see the Prime Minister just as I was leaving India in 2009. Uh, I had a chat with him, more or less made up my mind at the end of the conversation. And he said that, look, I mean, uh, we are interested, but there's still a procedure. And you realize some of the strengths of a democratic system that the Prime Minister can't tell you, here's the offer, you take it because I'm interested. There is a procedure. And at times you fret that the Indian procedures can be just endless, months go on, paperwork being done. But there is the plus side that no single person 
can take a decision like that. Yes, it was their interest, and I joined Kaufman. It's been a, a remarkable uh, run for me because India I've been, I taught for many years, I was back and forth even when I was in the US. I would spend good three months a year on the usual American academic leave in India. So there was nothing, I mean, I'm very familiar terrain, Delhi in particular. But government was a totally different cup of tea. My only interaction with government before that, in fact, there are two things of interest is, I had had no interaction with government and never before in India had there been a chief economic advisor with no experience of the Indian government. And I actually thought that was a sign of India's boldness and growing confidence that they could bring someone in from outside, offer it from someone outside. One of the reasons why I was keen to take it on was also India's boldness. My, in fact, only interaction before that was early 1990s, and Raghav might remember, at the Delhi School of Economics, we were working to set up a new center called the Center for Development Economics. And, you know, in India, to do something like that, you need a host of government permission and clearance. I thought that was about as selfless an act as possible, setting up a center which was guzzling up my time, but I was being given a run for my money. A Ministry of Finance, Home Ministry, you phone up, they don't reply, you, you write letters to them, no response. Then I thought I'll have to see the Finance Minister. So I made an appointment, the Finance Minister at that time was the current Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh. So I went to see him and trying to make sure that I don't keep him waiting, I went early, very early, and I was in his waiting area for a longish time. And a lot of these people who were being very rude with me, the bureaucrats in the Ministry of Finance, would peep in, see me there, they realized I'm waiting to see the finance minister. And the psychology of government is quite interesting. I didn't know that that would make a difference. But seeing there, then I got to see the finance minister. After that, my letters were being responded to and phone calls were being returned. Things began to move, just wait, being in the waiting area. So much so that I had thought I'd write to the finance minister and tell him that from now on till the center is fully set up, if he would allow me to come once a week to his office, I would not disturb him at all. I would quietly sit in his waiting room area, make myself visible and then vanish from there. Well, the center took off. That was my only experience of government, government interaction and then into government. And I must tell you, um, the trade culture shock that I was in a different setting was my very first or second day, uh, my government driver, who's a very senior person in the government, who drives me around, I was getting, I got into the car and I was reaching out for my seat belt. And he, a uh, seasoned government driver, knew that I was coming from being a professor to being the chief economic advisor. Somewhat embarrassed by my reaching out for a seat belt, he turned to me and said, Sir, now that you're chief economic advisor, you don't need to wear a seatbelt. <laughs> and you know, with a jolt, you realize it's a different worldview for my driver. And that first day, I did not actually wear a seatbelt. I felt so bad I couldn't offend him. I just clutched onto my seat and uh, had to be driven rapidly. Uh, subsequently, he's compromised uh, to me when I'm in the front seat. I do do that indeed. Well, friends, um, let me tell you. Um, um, the way I'm going to pitch this is um, from an outsider's view, and since this is an academic gathering, let me tell you about the peculiarities of uh, policy making, economic policy making, uh, which puts us in a very, very different, uh, unusual spot. I had a fascinating conversation today with your policy makers over lunch, and you realize the great difference between, say, economic policy making and an engineer's problem, an engineer building a bridge or an aircraft in a country. There is no sense in which people feel that uh, they should participate fully in the building of an aircraft. So you are never told that, look, in building this aircraft, you need to worry about majority opinion, about the length of the wingspan or the angle of the nose of the aircraft. If you did all that with majority opinion, the plane would be unlikely to fly. But when you do economic policy making, there is societal participation, very, very healthy participation. But you also realize that that puts severe restrictions on what you can do because democracy encroaches on this terrain of decision making. And this is not as if people are making a mistake and participating. Economics is very awkwardly placed discipline. It's a half, a science which is halfway there. 
So running the economy of the country is like running a half understood machine. A machine where the best minds, the best professionals don't quite fully know whether pressing on the gas pedal will make the, this machine speed up or slow down. Whether the gear, uh, which one is the back gear, which one is the front gear, there are uncertainties about the various knobs and switches that they are there in the machine. This positioning of the machine is indeed, places it very, very peculiarly, and you need to be aware of both. If you think of an economy as something written up in a textbook manner, then you would make the mistake with which many very academically uh, oriented economists in government would make. They would pull out their textbooks, try to follow the way you would do with an engineering problem, take out a book and decide how to assemble this. You would make very, very big mistakes. You have to allow intuition, common sense to play a role. And to that extent, of course, civil society has a big role to play with its intuition and common sense. But if you leave it to that, if you just think that it is all common sense and guess what, that we know nothing about the machinery, you make another set of mistakes, that you run an economy based on populism. Everything is just by what appears to be right. But the economy is full of little bits that we do understand very well, where very often what appears like good policy is bad policy, what appears to be bad policy is good policy. We know this through research, we know this through statistics and information collected over time. So this creation of space, where you have space for professional information and also public view being taken in, but the professionalism not being drowned out by populism is a very difficult, treacherous, narrow path. And for most emerging economies, this is ill-understood. There's too little room for professionalism. Most of it is on populism. What seems right to the masses is what you want, you're pressurized to carry out. I feel India's changing point of the economy, and time being short, I'm not going to go to before 1991. The Indian economy began to change in 1991. And it was because for the first time, India was beginning to behave actually in terms of the use of knowledge a bit like an industrialized country. We were bringing in the best information, opinion, aware that, look, there are lots of things we don't know, but there are things we know, and we ought to put these into place and get them functioning. What happened in 1991, which allowed us to do this, and really the tribute has to go to the current prime minister, who was then the finance minister, he took advantage of a great opportunity along with the prime minister then, who actually created the space for these professionals to come in and make very major moves. And Arasen Marao, I mean, we must not forget that. What happened was the Gulf War, the first Gulf War in 1991, meant that remittance money to India dried up. Those days, and that is a part of the Indian economy that has changed totally, the bulk of India's foreign exchange flow inflow was remittance money. And remittance does not come from well-off professionals, professors, engineers all over the world. They don't send that much money home. But the workers who have their family back home, who want to go back and settle down in their old age, send a lot of money back home. In 1991, that remittance dried up during the Gulf War simply because the workers had to scamper away from a large part of the, their usual Middle Eastern terrain. When that foreign exchange started vanishing, India reached a day, this was in the middle of 1991, when there was enough foreign exchange reserve with the government for 13 days of usual imports. So that would run out very soon if we continued the way we were doing. India has always been a risk-averse country. Latin Americans usually take big gambles, occasionally they do very well, then occasionally they stumble. Indians don't like to do that. I mean, we play it safe, you grow less, but you don't want to default on your big international loans. When we were on the brink of an international default, it was a national crisis. You did not want the country to default, and the government that time in which you retrospectively you look at it, and you marvel, took advantage of that and put through a slew of reform measures, 
things that were being talked about for ages, but nothing was being done. We had a licensing system. If you want to start a business, you have to get a license from government. To get that license, you would be given a run for your money. Uh, the licensing system was revoked. You can start up without a license. You, of course, still need environmental permissions and other things. And I still think India is too far mired in a permissionistic society. But one of the biggest hurdles, the license, was removed. India's tariff fall had gone sky high. We were a very open cultural political society, but a very, very closed economy. And it's a strange competition among politicians historically, each one raising the tariff a bit more and showing one's national commitment that I'm protecting the economy by raising the tariffs, meant that the tariffs had gone sky high. And a sense of how high the tariffs had gone was very clear from a statement by Dr. Manmohan Singh as finance minister that time, when in 1991 he said, I will bring down the tariff ceiling down to 150%. You know, there are very few countries in the world that can bring it down to 150%. You can take it up to 150%. But it just showed where we had gone. Slew of reforms put in. Very difficult year, 1991. The income growth was close to zero. Uh, the, uh, next year was also sluggish. Then things began to change. These reforms that were put into place began changing the economy. And the most important changes were uh, let me give this to you briefly because I want to get into the contemporary situation very quickly. The most important change that took place, you could see, is opening up the international sector. Exports and imports were made much easier. You could convert on the current account currency very easily to dollars. And people were saying initially when these reforms were put in that if you make it so easy for people to take dollars out of the country, then the mega $5 billion that India has will exit the country and we'll be left without it. But you know, this is where you need, again, a little bit of, not even professional thought, but a good, clear thinking and a commitment to pursue that clear thinking. If you prevent people from taking out dollars out of the country, you're also discouraging them from bringing dollars into the country in the first place. So allowing them to take dollars out of the country means they can bring the dollars in in the first place feeling a bit more secure that they can also take the dollars out. India used to have a foreign exchange reserve of roughly $5 billion for 14 years from 1977 to 1991. $5 billion with the Reserve Bank of India. Occasionally going down to three, occasionally rising to seven. After the opening up and giving people the freedom to take their dollars out and freer flow of goods and services, what used to be $5 billion for 14 years did not vanish. It began rising and over the next 14 years it reached to $300 billion. So something which had remained $5 billion roughly for 14 years rose to $300 billion over the next 14 years. India's growth rate, which used to be very, very sluggish, from 1994, moved up to 7% per annum. We got three consecutive years of 7% growth. And after that, it slowed down a little bit. It dropped to 4.5% in 1977-78. And some of you will be able to guess why that was happening. Nothing to do with India. It was the East Asian crisis. India was not too open an economy then. We had just begun opening up. So we did not take too bad a hit, but we did take a hit. The growth rate dropped a little bit, and then it picks up. The next pickup takes place around 2003, and it goes surging ahead. The big change that has taken place is the globalization of the country, and I'll inflict a couple of numbers on you on this, and you can see that quite apart from the growth rate having picked up, the growth rate from 2005 moved into 9% per annum, 9% plus per annum for three years, dropped a little bit in 2008 to 6.7. The global crisis was there. Climbed back to 8.4 for two years. And the year that has just ended, 2011-12, we did do badly. It has dropped to 6.5% the growth. I'll come back to that current scene in a moment. In terms of numbers, and you can see quite apart from other changes, the integration with the globe that has taken place. 
around the middle of 1995, our total exports plus imports, India's, as a percentage of the national income was 19%, around 1995. 15 years later, 2010, that 19% had increased to 38%, doubled up the share of exports and imports. Exports and imports of services grew up from, I don't have the exact figure with me, from something like 4% in 1995 to over 12% 15 years later. And capital flows, the total amount of capital coming in and exiting from India in 1995 was roughly 15% of the national income had climbed to 54%. And I've already told you about the foreign exchange balance from $5 billion to $300 billion. Right now we are sitting at $292 billion. It tends to change every day. I've been outside of India for two days now, but you know, it's roughly, roughly that. Yeah. So that's where we are. What happened uh, was the first growth unleashing in 1991 with the reforms. The main reforms were in the international sector. India was opened up. India was allowed to trade freely. And we got the benefits of that. And some of these numbers I just gave you in terms of global integration of India, I think are a fallout of that. There's another fallout that came around 2003. What happened then? is the following. And here there's a lot of intertwining with politics that takes place and I'm not a political scientist or a specialist in international relations, but I'll give you my somewhat amateur account of what I think did happen around 2002, 3, 4, which gave India the second big bust of growth. And after that, I mean really uh, the global perception, India's own perception of India changed around 2004 or so. What happened is I believe that um, the scope, the positioning of India in the global polity began to change. And that's, there's economics behind it, there's politics behind it. India and the United States, both countries with very simple, similar political um, um, structure, Commitment to secularism, commitment to democracy, yes, there were occasional blemishes in all this, but these were very, very deep commitments in India, very similar in the United States. Nevertheless, there was a lot of knee-jerk animus between the two countries. Some, some element of dismissiveness on the part of the United States and a certain amount of anger on the part of India. That changed, can't quite tell why, but there are certainly two factors you can look at. The US has had an immigration policy where you don't let in all Indians, but it is professional Indians. Not the best thing to do because you're allowing only the cream to get in, but it begins to change the relationship between the two countries. The H-1B visa category in the United States, which is professionals, engineers, computer scientists, professors, roughly for many, many years, half the H-1B visas the US would give out would go to Indians. The second biggest group would be the Chinese with about 10%. So Indians were getting a disproportionate amount of this. And the Silicon Valley Indians that uh, grew and got nurtured over there became a sort of contact point between India and the United States. It also gave a boost to India's exports to United States and services exports because every time, I mean, you, you're sitting around and you know, there's some very expensive software work you're doing. If you've got lots of people from Bangalore, all you need is someone to say that, look, I've got a couple of fellows over there. They are pure technicians, but they can do this job very cheap. And this information channel, once it opened up, the services started getting outsourced quite a bit to India. And India's services sector growth was the, the, absolutely the world's highest, higher than China's, higher than any country's, for about 15 years. And that was the driver of India's growth. And this link with the United States was helped by another factor, which um, is um, US's worry about the rise of China. And this is the worry of the following kind. The United States, after the downfall of uh, Russia, Russia as a, uh, a political global force, the US was in a very comfortable zone as the single big power in the world. Over time, it has become clear that that is not what the world is going to look like. There will be at least one more big power uh, in play internationally, which is China. 
And you know what's the worst kind of ideal scenario for a country is that you are the big power, one big power. And in some ways the worst is that there are just two big powers because it's a face-off, it's a much more dangerous world. You need a couple of other big players on the block. It's an element of comfort you get out of that. And I think the United States calculation was India is a potential in this region. And interestingly enough, even for China, the reason why India's relationship with China has just continued to improve steadily is that for China also there is a perception that it will not be simply Chinese-dominated world. It's going to be a face-off with the United States or another couple of big powers. And it is comforting to have another one come up. And India was viewed as a big player in the world. There is very often an Indian naval, a naval presence in the Straits of Malacca. And I'm told that one of the reasons is that uh, this is maybe the world's most active shipping corridor, freight corridor today, the Straits of Malacca. And the US is worried that if it is simply a single country control over there and something goes wrong politically between the US and China, and that link gets cut off. Or there is a terrorist movement that cuts off that trade link through the Straits of Malacca. It becomes a world economy it will go tumbling if that happens. So I guess, and I've been told, there are knobs and rings through which the US does not mind Indian presence over there. And so that this is, of course, the political side of that. And then there is the terrorist threat, which India has faced some uh, huge, dreadful actions which the United States has fed. So these things brought, brought these two countries together. And actually, the sort of everyday relationship between the US and India changed quite dramatically. There was another side effect which I believe uh, uh, played a role. During the elections, the US elections 2004, uh, this came up in a big way, that uh, the outsourcing of back office work to India and a certain amount to the Philippines, to Indonesia, to South Africa, was a big television debate. So there were people would go on television and say that, look, there are Americans being unpatriotic and sending off their work uh, to these poor countries and making greater profit. Lou Dobbs, uh, the television commentator, uh, conservative television commentator in the United States would go evening after evening talking about the unpatriotic American entrepreneurs. I think what happened with this is for lots of entrepreneurs who did not know the small entrepreneurs that you can save some cost by sending work out. It was like an advertisement on television channel every evening that you can make some more profit by sending some more work out of the country. And actually, if you look at the small outshopping of this kind of work out of the United States, it's gone up very sharply from 2003-04. So I take it to be the sort of Lou Dobbs effect. Because for these small India, not the big ones, but the small Indian operators who do this, Advertising on American television is so expensive that on their own they would never be able to advertise their services. <laughs> but the criticism of what they were doing turned out to be a free advertisement every evening. And that actually, I do believe it's a serious point that that did cause another spike. And from 2005, there was really no looking back for the Indian economy. The current scenario, I should just briefly tell you that uh, with Australia, I will come back and talk about this, but I think there's a lot of scope again. For again, for reasons of secularism, democracy, and now that India is a bit of a serious economic player. Those two were there for a very long time, but India is now a serious economic player. I think the scope for collaboration with Australia, not just economic collaboration, but economic strategic collaboration is huge and really done right this is a sector that can grow with collaboration on education, collaboration on a variety of goods, mining, and even a certain amount of political collaboration. I feel there is a very large uh, possibility over here. The current scenario, I'm going a bit behind uh, my time schedule. Yeah, here is, uh, well, I've already given you the growth numbers. The growth, as I said, it picked up once again in 2005 when we grew for three consecutive years for uh, over 9%. <coughs> After that, the slowdown was a little slowdown. The slowdown caused by the global situation picked up again. This year has been a difficult year. 
But the major drivers of India's growth among them, since this is again an academic audience, I'll point to just one particular indicator which is extremely heartening, is for emerging countries, there is a very, very prominent uh, theory for economists, a theory which was actually first discovered, what do you do with the theory you discovered it, I suppose, discovered by uh, and actually an uh, American economist and an Australian economist, uh, Solo and Swan, wrote out these growth models where the same year, where they showed that for an emerging economy, this doesn't quite work as effectively for an industrialized country like Australia. If you save and invest a large part of your national income, that gives a boost to your growth. What do I mean literally of the total national income, the percentage that you save. India currently saves 35% of its national income. The amount that you invest, meaning of the total the mic is here. I, I hope I'm not uh, disturbing the level of volume by moving in and out, but I'll stay. Try to be here. The, uh, of the total production, the fraction which is uh, uh, machinery investment, basically, factories, etc., that needs to be large. For India, that I said the figure wrong. The investment is 35%, savings is 32.5%. So we are, of all the goods produced, 35% is investment goods. These are the kinds of numbers you used to see in East Asian countries during the heydays of their growth, Korea, Singapore, etc. And India was never thought of as a high saving, high investing country. In this respect, we used to be a bit like a Latin American country or an industrialized country. But this changed, changed for a variety of reasons, politically very interesting why we became a high saving, high investment country. But the fact of the matter is that, that is the case. And that is driving the economy, I think, despite a lot of the turmoil, that and the improvement in the, through the reforms were the major drivers, and you're seeing the economy do well after that. Now, in the current situation, the last year has been a very difficult year, and the growth number that, uh, that came out yesterday of the last quarter is a very disappointing number, which puts down last year's growth at 6.5%. And the last quarter of last year's growth is down to 5.3%. So this is not heartening. Yes, at one level, even this remark is a bit of a reflection of the change, the yardstick. Because 15 years ago, 6.5% growth would not be a matter of lament. But it's a good sign in India today that with this growth, there's a lot of anger and people are upset that something is being done wrong and we are slowing down. What is happening? Well, there are two factors or three factors behind the slowdown, and I believe that it is a temporary slowdown that is happening. Uh, it will change sooner rather than later, but let me give you my reasoning. The cause of the slowdown, the most important one, which is affecting every country in the world, virtually, Australia is not too affected by this, which is the Eurozone crisis. We are all worried about what happens on the 17th of June when Greece has an election and will that be the start of Greece dropping out of the Eurozone country. What happens during an uncertainty of this kind is money, investors' money, when the global investors begin to worry that there will be global turmoil, there is a tendency on the part of investors to take money out from wherever in the world, put it in a couple of safe places, the US Treasury is considered a safe place, so a lot of the money investment, foreign institutional investors' money begin to exit from different countries and all go in largely into the US Treasury, some into German sovereign bonds, the money fly there. And we actually have the numbers. It is happening over the last couple of months. Foreign institutional investors are taking their money out of India, taking and a lot of it is going into the treasuries. And the irony of this world is, this actually began in a very sharp way in August, I believe, 2011. August or was it July? August, early August, when Standard & Poor's downgraded United States. What happened with the United States being downgraded? Money started going into the United States. It's a very peculiar thing. When the US was downgraded, there was fear that there's going to be global turmoil. The economy will be affected all over the world. Europe will be affected. Where do you put your money? Not in U.S. stock markets, but in U.S. treasuries. 
And the view of the investor is that in the US treasuries, you will make no money because they don't pay you any interest. You'll probably lose a little bit from the 2% inflation that the US has, but you won't lose your money. When you're nervous, your main thing is you don't want to lose the principal, and so money rushes into, into the United States. And the appreciation of the US dollar and the depreciation of the Indian rupee, Brazilian uh, real, South African run, uh, even the South Korean won, Mexican peso that you've seen over the last two months, is all a reflection of money exiting these countries going into the United States and Germany. And indeed, that this is affecting us in a big way. Two other factors played a role. India had an inflation of roughly 10% over the last two years. That's considered intolerable actually in India. And politicians also, fortunately on this, are fully on board that you need to bring it down because nothing annoys an electorate as much as generally rising prices. And you tend to lose elections if that, this happens for a long time. The inflation was put on a war footing. But in an emerging economy, I had a fascinating lunchtime discussion with policymakers in Australia. In an emerging economy, inflation control, we don't quite know. We don't have these three variables. You control them and inflation comes down. It's one of those semi-understood areas of economic management. We have some idea of what these control variables are, but we don't have full ideas. And most, most lay people feel that inflation is something which the government announces almost like a fiscal deficit. But inflation is the product of the actions of hundreds and thousands and millions of individuals. We have some sense of how to control, but not a full sense. I'll give you one kind of complication that you get in inflation control. Usually we talk in terms of inflation control. The central bank has to control the money supply to control inflation. But see, one thing which I'm certain is happening in India is Indian rural households tend to put their savings, keep their savings as cash under the pillow. Most of them don't have bank accounts, they don't know the stock markets, they keep their cash, savings as cash. Over the last three, four years, there's been a huge effort in India, this is called the Financial Inclusion Program, which is to get people to not keep their money as cash, but put it into various forms of savings. But, and with this financial inclusion, see what is happening. Money, which was effectively outside the system because the who are keeping them stashed away in their home, is being injected back into the economy. So even if the Reserve Bank of India is not changing its policy, Ministry of Finance is not changing any policy, ordinary people getting brought into the economy means their money, which was effectively outside the system, goes back into the system. So the effective money supply in the country begins to increase, chasing the same number of goods, and prices begin to rise. So it's very, very likely that one of the factors causing India's inflation is the financial inclusion program. There are other things, of course. There is the repo rate, there is the fiscal deficit play a role, but inflation is a partially understood subject, and most lay people have very great difficulty in understanding that there can be things which are partially understood. We don't quite know what to do. I still have relatives in Calcutta who will phone me in the middle of the day very, very upset. These are usually elderly aunts who are courageous enough to pick up the phone and say, you know, even today the prices have gone up in the market next to my home. The expectation is that we sitting in the Ministry of Finance can do something and put it all under control, all over. And we do know in a few cases when countries have tried to control prices through diktat from the center, you have low prices but no goods. The goods will vanish from the shelves. The goods will be gone, black marketed, just not there. The Soviet Union and the uh, um, communist countries of East Europe faced huge problems from that. So this is one of the problems and bringing this down meant that we've tried to control demand and with that there has been a slowing down of, as demand has been contracted, growth has also contracted. And the third factor, there has been a slowdown in decision making and reforms in India. It's controversial, people don't like to talk about it, but I think that's a fact. And the reason is the complications from politics. Uh, there are certain moves that we made half made. We were opening our doors to foreign direct investment in the retail sector. Controversial, controversial to the point even my colleagues in the United States write to me and say, oh, what an awful thing you're doing for India, trying to open the doors to uh, uh, big retailers. But I think in a poor country, you do need the big retailers to come in. 
the government was about to open the doors to foreign direct investment in the retail, multi-brand retail sector, got stalled, got stalled by the coalition polit political pressures. There were other reforms which have got stalled over the last six months, and I think that is also taking a toll. These three things put together have placed a pressure on growth in India. What we need now is, I will take five minutes, uh, uh, Radha Bhusa, thank you, by the way, if that is all right. Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. Why am I optimistic despite these last six, nine months of poor performance? Poor performance, again, you have to think of this in uh, contrast to what we are doing. Well, a couple of reasons. The fundamentals that I was pointing to, the, the huge savings rate, the huge investment rate, all those remain intact. Yes, they've gone down a little bit, but once you're in the mid-30 percentages, it's a very handsome figure to be. Even if the 35% goes down to 34%, 33%, it's still a very big figure. So that driver is in place. Where India needs um, uh, um, uh, reform are two areas, infrastructure and governance. Infrastructure, I think you will see big changes over the next five years. Uh, as early as five years, changes are already taking place. There, I think China is playing a very useful role for India. It's the frequent now movement of people between India and China. I mean, uh, people going there, having meetings, coming back. They can see what a relatively poor country. I mean, China's today growing very rapidly, but it's still an emerging economy. It's still um, uh, the per capita income, nowhere near that of industrialized countries. But you see what it has done to its infrastructure. India has very big plans for infrastructural development, and these plans are, I think, on pretty firm footing. So you will see changes in that. That's going to feed into the growth as well. Governance is much stickier. I hope there are big changes in governance. I've actually talked to my uh, some Australian friends because at one level we all inherited the same governance structure from Britain. I've also actually talked to British makers and bureaucrats uh, that it's inherited the same system, but somehow you people have changed, modified much more. India has been much more stubborn with the old uh, colonial system in terms of uh, rules of governance, and we remain very sluggish in terms of the governance. But that may happen, that may not happen. But here is the reason why I feel we will go back to our growth path of high 8%, 8.5%, 9% we will go back, because the governance has been more or less constant from 1947. India has grown despite that, and one merciful difference between India and China is our government, by all measures, is a small government. It does interfere, try to interfere in many things, but it's not as strong and powerful a government as the Chinese government. So even with the bureaucracy and the interference, it's a relatively small government, and our entrepreneurs have learned to work around that, so I think that will stand us in good stead. We do need to make reforms, and I've already begun writing this lecture, and when I write it up, I will write, put in some ideas of the structure of decision making in government which does need reform. But final point, and this is again reverting back to politics, why I remain very, very hopeful. Yes, economic mistakes have taken place the last year has been difficult. The bureaucracy, uh, the slowness of decision making has been there with us, and despite that the economy is growing fast. If we can manage to reform that, we will break into the 9.5% growth. If we don't, we will be at 8.5%, still it's very good. But the reason actually I'm hopeful for the medium to long term is India invested in something, not quite deliberately, these things happen in retrospect, you are grateful it happened, in a political structure which is quite remarkable for a poor country. It's democracy and the vibrant uh, media. The media is vibrant to the point where you at times wish it were a bit less vibrant than it is. <laughs> Any event and you're stepping out of the Ministry of Finance and you'll have 20 journalists uh, 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 descend on you, asking you a hundred different questions, and even a non-answer gets flashed next day that there was no answer, and, and people try to make meaning out of the non-answer on a particular matter. But it's diagnosed, it's analyzed, it's criticized very, very happily, and uh, very, very intensely, and I think that plays a big role. Democracy has deep roots in India. There's a civil society activism. I feel a lot of civil society activism often can be wrong-headed, but that is civil society activism. You 
would never want to wish them away because very often these are the, actually the most honest people with a lot of personal integrity. And whether you agree with their views or not, they play a very, very valuable role in churning up ideas. Politically, getting your system right is probably harder than getting your economic policies right. And India has made a huge investment in a particular political system. We have to be grateful to our founding fathers and their very deep commitment to this, Gandhi, Nehru, and others, to this system, which we've inherited. What I worry about China, and since we are so close to China, and this I've actually talked in Xiamen University um, a few years ago, what worries me about China is that China has done so very well because this very, very powerful government in China is an extremely intelligent government. So they've adopted very good policies, and very good policies where you allow individual incentives to play also in the right way. But when a very powerful government, which is not easy to dislodge because you don't quite know how you dislodge, when such a government falters and makes mistakes, that can be a very, very difficult route because then you dig in your heels you begin to adopt policies which are good for you, those who are at the helm rather than for the country, and suddenly things can dissemble very rapidly. I worry about that for China. And worry is the word I use because there is nothing being in the same region, there is nothing you would wish for a neighboring country but to do well. If you have any sense, you want those countries to do well because you get all the good fallout of that country doing well. But I feel for China there is that risk. China will have to, at some point, sort out its political system, and that's a very difficult sorting out uh, that has to be done. India makes economic mistakes, big mistakes. The government will get thrown out of power. Another group will come. They'll experiment with something. Also, in economics, you make mistakes. You revert back, and you get out of it. There are countries which have done successfully. Park Chung-hee, uh, very strong arm policies in the beginning, but Korea, with through some difficult years, has made changes for the better. North Korea was not so lucky. It did have rapid growth, actually, in the early years. But then, once it began faltering, there was no way. It began to spin away in the wrong direction. I feel this big investment with India, coupled with the fact that policies have moved on to the right path in the medium term from 1991, and gradually people, ordinary people, have got faith in the way the economy is being run means that, yes, we will go through this period of one year, two years of economic difficulty, and we will turn back. Europe has a difficult couple of years ahead. The big borrowing that was done by Europe in December 2011 and February 2012, the LTRO, the unleashing of $1.3 trillion onto European banks that were teetering. There was no choice in the matter. I think ECB did the right thing. But pumping in so much money with a three-year window, you have to pay that money back, means that some of this problem will come back to you in three years' time. Because these are banks which were not actually doing very well. You've kept them afloat by putting in this money. And at that point of time, there was no choice. You would have precipitated a crisis. So what Draghi did, what ECB did is right, but if during the three years from the two big infusions of money, things are not corrected, there's going to be big turmoil in Europe, we will have to live with that in the world, but for an emerging economy and also for industrialized economies like Australia, a bit outside the mainstream industrialized economy, this is the time to strengthen yourself. And that's what annoys me occasionally about India, is that we are not using this time to strengthen our fist, strengthen our monetary policy, everything possible so that even if a big European turmoil comes, you know that you will come out of that as a player that is driving some of the global economy but by providing the engines of growth at that point of time. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Basu has agreed to take some questions. So, um, if, uh, if the audience have questions, could you uh, identify yourself, hand up, and then identify yourself and ask your question? Yes, please over here. I enjoyed your presentation. Yes, I recognize you. I didn't want to risk uh, uh, trying to say I recognize and get it wrong. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I enjoyed your presentation very much. In fact, I'm a great admirer of your work, not only your academic writing, but also 
the three compendium of your corporate pieces uh, of people and places, economic graffiti and uh, economic miscellany, which also contain a drama as well. Uh, my question relates to your comparison between Indian and uh, South uh, East Asian and Chinese experience. Uh, as your growth figures uh, claim point out, India's growth rate over the last five years is not very different from that of China or that of the East Asian economies at the takeoff stage in the 70s. But uh, there's a big difference between, between Indian experience and the East Asian experience when you look at one important economic indicator, which is employment creation. Uh, the rate of employment growth has not kept up with the dramatic growth in the economy and some economists like Vijay Josi, Arvind Pranagari and others, they have coined up the growth process, the employmentless growth, simply because it has implication for the poverty story, uh, uh, because uh, labor is the only uh, wealth owned by the poor. You can't inject money to the poor without generating employment. This is also part of the reason behind the government's ability to sell the reforms. Uh, policy paralysis is also related to this. Uh, do you consider this as a big problem as the chief economic advisor? Uh, if so, uh, in your view, what are the underlying reasons? Uh, yeah, uh, Professor Atagora, no, thank you very much. Very good question. I, I agree with it. Whether or not I was chief economic <coughs> advisor, I would agree uh, with this. Uh, a major concern, and what is being pointed out, by the way, I should just tell you though, you must not equate employment fully with um, the poverty, because in India the poverty is falling, it's still very large, but especially over the last five years, there's been a very sharp decline in the percentage of people below the poverty line. Where the poverty line is drawn is very controversial in India, if you read Indian newspapers, you'll know it. But no matter where you draw, if you use the same line over time, you will see that there is a very sharp drop over the last five years. But a lot of this is direct action by government, pumping in money uh, into rural areas. And I take your question to be that actually for a more robust, long-run um, growth and dynamism in the economy, you need proper, normal employment. People find jobs. Here there is a very controversial element of Indian policy making that I think gets in the way. Something called the Industrial Disputes Act in India Hiring and firing laws, and this was done without very well-meaning uh, um, uh, sense that it's very difficult to fire workers if you are an organized sector employer. And you know the shocking thing in India is the number of people organ working in the organized sector in India is approximately 10 million. Can you believe in a country with 1.2 billion population, some 50, 60 billion working age population, 10 million are working in the organized sector and about half of that will be the government. So a private organized sector is minuscule. I believe one of the reasons, and this is very controversial, you can't even bring it into public debate, it's difficult, that we need to change our uh, labor laws to uh, get this to change. And in particular, this sounds very harsh when you say this, is that there has to be room for downsizing of firms. I've spent a lot of time with Indian textile uh, factories, uh, people who are supplying to the New York market. And they say all the time, New York fashions change. So if you're supplying uh, products which are responding to New York fashions, there are, there's a sudden summer where you need to swell your uh, labor force. But after you've swelled your labor force, if you can't downsize it, if you're stuck with it, when the demand has gone, what do you do? You just said, well, I mean, I don't want to live for the next 10 years with a large workforce. I'll just not take up this demand, which is, I know, the demand for three months. I will not take it. I will not supply. So India's textile sector has suddenly been affected by this. One is this becomes a very ideologically heated debate. And I think this is, again, where what I was saying this is a good question because it illustrates my original point. If you are just looking at a policy in a nature fashion, there are certain policies which are thought of as right-wing and left-wing. As soon as you say that, look, there should be some more space for downsizing of firms, that is right-wing. And then you don't think through any more. And everywhere I have to tell in India, in, when I speak in India and I talk about this, I say that, you know, my deep sympathies are all left sympathies. But 
you have to be intelligent about policy making. And in the end, it's workers who will benefit the most if you allow this flexibility because there's going to be greater demand for labor once you allow the downsizing. I know this is not the only thing. There are other factors. The lack of infrastructure also plays a role. The reason why India's services sector did so well and manufacturing sector, which could have provided employment, did not, is the services sector did not face the two big stumbling blocks that I talked about. Infrastructure and governance. India's services sector typically does not produce things which you have to put on a cart and send over the road and then uh, at a port load onto a ship and send out. That you do with your manufactured products. A lot of the services sector skips over the infrastructure. All you need is electricity and uh, that can be uh, captive generation, a couple of uh, computer terminals and a lot of your services work you can do. So the services sector was not affected by India's poor infrastructure. Bureaucracy and uh, uh, governance. The services sector used to be outside the tax net. India did not tax the services sector, which means they, for the most part, they did not have to interact with government. Left free of the hurdle of infrastructure and governance, it just zoomed uh, uh, ahead, did very well. Manufacturing sector, which is the employment generator, faced both these hurdles and employment has done well. Uh, what I expect over the next years is what I said in the lecture, I believe that the infrastructure hurdle will go very quickly. So the manufacturing sector, I do expect to pick up growth, so employment will begin to pick up in that sector, but if we can change our labor laws, at least have them debated in public before we do something about it, and do something about improvement in governance, employment will grow very rapidly, and that is, I agree, very, very important in the long run. That's As you see, I give very long answers. So. <laughs> the shorter question. Yeah. Yeah. So, Roger Shokaji from Defense. Uh, my question, is, I guess, is a two-parter one, follows from the previous one. What prospects do you see for reform in the agricultural sector? And also, what is the appetite for reform within the Indian electorate? Has that changed in any noticeable way over the last 15, 20 years? Uh, let me take on the latter. I do think that has changed. Um, they oppose a lot of what uh, reforms that the government tries, but much less than in 1991. And I remember 1991 when the reforms took place, I used to occasionally write in the newspaper and support the reforms that were taking place. And the attacks you got is that there's a mindless set of reforms just following the Washington consensus. That has gone now in India. So it has improved, but you will always get a lot of pushback that you get even in industrialized countries. Any democratic country, sensible or insensible policy, you'll get a pushback on both. But that's a part. So I think in general, India has improved on that. Agricultural policy. Um, we haven't done too well on that. But there are details of our acquisition of the way we acquire some food and try to release to the poor. I have a long paper on that, but I don't think you are asking for that. I won't. Uh, bore you with the details of that, we can improve on that, and I'd like to talk to you after this. But the bigger one is if government could provide some basic infrastructure in agriculture, and then step away, allow people then to use their enterprise and do well, I feel a lot will come out of that. But am I that hopeful on infrastructure, agricultural infrastructure, a little bit less than industrial infrastructure, urban infrastructure, because India's infrastructural boom that is already occurring and I think will occur over the next five years is, as I said, being driven by urban elite Indians traveling to US and UK all right, but there they shrug and say, of course, a rich country will have good infrastructure. But the travel with China has made them aware that you can do a lot. But the urban elite's first reaction is you think of the urban industrial infrastructure. There, I feel pretty confident India is going to be transformed over the next five years. To agriculture, it will have to be through lobbying, through insistence that it's very important. So it will go slower is my expectation, but you, you should see some positive fallout there as well. One part of this gentleman here. Yeah. Thank you. Your Excellency, uh, could you please uh, elaborate on the impact of Indian population growth on the Indian economic uh, growth? Uh, and also, what do you think of the security of the region because in both cases, like population growth and security of the region, the state, Indian states, may not have that much control, and that might have a significant impact. 
significant impact on the quality of the yes. Okay, uh, population first of all. Uh, India's population is large, growing, but the growth rate incidentally, uh, let me move here again, the growth rate has come down. It's going at about 1.5, 1.4% 1 per annum. So way down from what it used to be the growth rate. Uh, population took a bit of a setback, our population policy from aggressive government uh, uh, population policy and forced sterilization in 1975 to 1977. That became such a bad word, population policy, that no politician ever mentions it. But as the economy develops, uh, people realize the benefits of a relatively well-managed household. And that has led to a sharp falling off of fertility. Uh, and for instance, the state of uh, West Bengal has seen one of the sharpest declines in uh, fertility. But all over India, it's dropping off and the population growth has gone down. But what is changing in India's population is the structure. The age group from 15 to 60, which is often described as the demographic dividend from your question, I take it you're probably a demographer. That structure, that age group is increasing the population. There can be huge benefits that come from that. Ireland is a country that got a very big benefit from this humping of the working age population. India is seeing a rise in this. We are still in the foothills of the demographic dividend. 2034 is the year when our working age group population as a percentage of total population will peak. This gives us a couple of advantages. This is after all the working age population. So the dependent population shrinks. So you tend to do better through that. Another advantage you get, very small children of course don't save. They eat, they drink, they drink, sorry, water. I mean, not <laughs> and, and whatever else, they, they wear clothes but they don't earn an income. Very old people also have very little income but they eat, drink, in this case I did not qualify what kind of thing, it can be anything. And they wear clothes, they live in a house, etc. The savers are this working age population that save. So typically when a country goes into its demographic dividend mode, then this age group humps the savings rate goes up. So that's also going to feed into our growth process. The only downside of the way that demography is going is when the working age population peaks, if you are not imparting adequate skills to them, then you're getting a group that they can be more easily angered, more easily troubled, and if they are not being employed properly, and this uh, relates to Professor Atukarala's question, if you're not finding them jobs, if you're not giving them the skills, this can become a flashpoint. Some risk of that. India's Maoist movement, some insurgencies that you have in different parts of India, probably reflect a little bit of this problem that is uh, coming into play. But over the last two, three years, the government has woken up properly that over the next 15 years, you're going to get a swelling of this age group. So there are skill development plans, there are employment plans slowly, but all this is taking shape. So if you ask me to bet what will the population uh, 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 peaking do, I think it's going to actually help the country in a big way. Was there another part to your question of security? You know, I'm, I'm not the person to ask this uh, question. But yes, we uh, spend on defense. We also, uh, maybe uh, a bit too much at times, we interact with neighboring countries. Fortunately, the whole style of Cold War is tending to go away from the world. So you talk with countries with which there is a security problem. That with India and Pakistan, that is the biggest one. Because with China, we really don't, we have some border issues, but those are relatively minor border issues. With Pakistan, there is a potential flashpoint. And I personally believe that you have to keep talking and including them because also when at a people wise when you interact. The one time I've been to Lahore, once you're past the official them and in the streets, even when you're telling them that you're from India, that neighboring warring countries, there's a sense of commonness. And the sense of commonness we have to utilize, and I have to say, when I say this, the sense of commonness in the world, I like to stress, even though I, it's India's economic policy I work on, the world is too small a place for strident nationalism anywhere. I mean, you go to a faraway country, meet with people who on the face of it look very different, but you get to know them a little bit and you realize the commonness. And I think there is a case for us to push the human commonness on the globe, and again, a bit of a tribute to India's founding fathers. Nehru almost always awkward, because as Prime Minister of India, it's, he's championing the Indian cause, but he would always add that in the long run, this nationalism has to wear off, because it is a small world, and it has to be a global sense that we have. Rabindranath Tagore repeatedly talked that, and I think in the end, that's the best security that we have to nurture. Thank you very much.
is the 16th in the series. This lecture, along with the uh, message from the President, Her Excellency Shubhati Pratibha Patil, will be printed and be available from ESA, and the uh, soft copy of this uh, lecture will be available from, for free download from the ESA website as well. So at this time, it is my pleasant duty to bring this oration to a close by thanking the people and organizations who have contributed to making it such a great success. This oration is named after the now deceased Dr. K. R. Narayanan, former president of India. Dr. Narayanan inaugurated ASART in 1994 and continued his support to ASART throughout. And we are fortunate that we now have a photograph of Dr. Narayanan and his wife, uh, courtesy uh, Dr. Dikshan, my old friend. We have, we have here to, to show you along the, at the, at the Narayanan narration. We have in the audience here senior public servants from the Commonwealth, Government of Australia, the Indian High Commissioner, His Excellency Mr. Biren Nanda and Mrs. Nanda, and other senior members of the High Commission staff, as well as a number of distinguished guests from the Australia and India Council and the ANU, including the Vice Chancellor, Professor D. N. Yang. In particular, we would like to welcome High Commissioner Nanda and Mrs. Nanda and Professor Young, for whom this is their first Narayanan oration. In addition, we have a distinguished speaker, Vashik Basu, who has played a key role in recent economic policy making in India. And I'm sure you are all quite aware that he has played a very significant role. Following from President Narayanan, President APJ Abdul Kalam continued his support for the oration series. We are indeed grateful that the current President of India has continued her support for this lecture so that the Narayanan oration now forms part of the institutional link between the ANU and the Office of President of India. President Patil will be retiring next month. We thank her for her unflinching support for this oration since 2007 and wish her the very best in her retirement. The High Commissioner of India in Canberra and his staff, including Deputy High Commissioner Mr. V.K. Sharma and others have provided invaluable help in coordinating our contacts with the President's office and the logistics for this oration, for which I am much grateful. We look, look forward to the continued support of the Indian High Commission to the Narayanan oration and other ASR activity, activities. Mr. Sharma will soon be leaving Canberra for posting in South Africa, and I want to record my gratitude to him for his support to the oration and to Vesak and to wish him the very best for, this, for the future. Now I would like to thank the organizations and individuals who have made important contributions to this year's oration. When plans for this year's orations were being made, I approached the Australia and their council as in the past. I expressed my sincere gratitude to the AIC for financially supporting this year's lecture as well. I thank our Vice Chancellor, Professor Young, for chairing this oration. At ASAR, Stephanie Hancock, whom we have all met, worked tirelessly, tirelessly and efficiently in organizing the minutest details of this oration. I would like to thank her most sincerely for her many efforts. Finally, I thank our speaker, Dr. Kaushik Basu. ASAR is delighted and honored to be associated with him. We are sincerely grateful to Kaushik for taking the time and the trouble to prepare this oration and to undertake a long journey to be with us today. ASAR's list of Narayanan speakers leads like a who's who of important Indian economists and public figures. And Dr. Basu is a stellar addition to this list. The Narayanan oration now ranks among the very best India lecture series anywhere in the world. Koshik's oration has as usual been insightful and lucid. We thank you for it. Thank you all very much. <laughs> 